So, um, today's topic is spring, core spring, uh, spring 3.1 to spring 3.2 in a nutshell. What's uh, been implemented for 3.1 and what we're planning to implement for 3.2. Um, to get started, I'd like to say just a little bit of quickly about myself. My name is Sam Brandon. I'm a uh, spring and Java consultant. I work at a company called Swift Mind in Zurich, Switzerland that I founded with some colleagues a few years ago. Um, I've been developing Java for over 14 years, which is quite a long time for Java, I guess you could say. And I am a core Spring Framework developer. Um, I'm not a full-time employee of Spring Source. I have my own company, but I do still contribute to Spring, uh, core Spring, especially in the, the testing area. I'm also a Spring trainer, so from time to time um, I give core Spring courses. And I'm the lead author of Spring in a Nutshell, which uh, should be coming out from O'Reilly. We've been saying that for a while, so I try not to make any promises. But uh, this year sometime, we like to think. And it'll be covering 3.1. Uh, it sounds like the microphone's been turned up a bit now. <coughs> so before we start, um, a quick show of hands. Who actually uses Spring here? Not too surprising. Who's uh, still using Spring 2.5? Okay, Spring 3.0. Okay, 3.1. Okay, it's a surprising number. Um, has anyone been looking at or keeping up with a uh, 3.2 and some of some things that we're planning there? Anyone have any idea what's coming with 3.2? Okay, good because I won't really be able to make too many promises. I'll just basically talk about what we're what we're planning, and um, unfortunately, since there's no code yet for that, that'll just be a smaller part at the end of the, this talk. So moving on, what's the agenda? What are we gonna talk about in detail? Um, to start off, we're just gonna, gonna kind of do a review of the major themes in 3X, so starting with 3.0, um, also in 3.1, and um, then we'll go through the individual themes of 3.1 in, in greater detail. So last year, some of these things were talked about, but since then, these things have been fully implemented and in the release version of Spring 3.1. So we're gonna talk about environments and profiles, Maybe a bit too loud. Um, Java-based configuration, uh, testing support in Spring 3.1, caching support um, via annotations, and then some changes to MVC and REST for REST web services, um, servlet 3.0, and then some odds and ends. And then at the end, as I mentioned before, we'll talk about um, what's on the 3.2 roadmap. So what were the major themes in Spring 3.0? Can we maybe should lower? Too high? Is that better? We'll see. Okay. Sorry about that. <clears throat> so Java-based configuration, uh, first and foremost, adding support for um, using Java config instead of just using annotations, component scanning, or XML to configure your Spring apps. There also support for custom stereotypes. So in 2.5, we had support for stereotypes like um, service, at service, at controller, et cetera. And in um, Spring 3.1, you could, um, 3.0, sorry, then you could add things like my custom service stereotype or my transactional service, and you can combine the annotations as meta annotations, um, having a central location or a central configuration of a particular stereotype. Also support for annotated factory methods. So instead of implementing a factory bean, you could just have a factory method that you annotate with that bean, for example. Support for JSR 3.30, so that's the, um, common annotation toward a dependency injection in Java, so pushed by Spring and Juice. So for example, um, at inject as compared to Spring's at autowired. Also the Spring expression language. How many people actually use um, Spell, the Spring expression language at all? A few people? Okay, so we'll see a few examples later on with some caching. Um, REST support in Spring MVC, so that's RESTful Web Services, was added to the Spring MVC programming model. Also support on upgrade to Portlet API 2.0 and JSR 303 beam validation. So if you're familiar with things like uh, Hibernate Validator, this is the, the standard um, in Java for validation with annotations, and that was added, or support was added for that in Core Spring in 3.0. So, <clears throat> sorry, 3.1. Um, and Java EE support as well, so JPA upgrade to 2.0 and JSF upgrade to 2.0. Moving on, now, what are the major themes in Spring 3.1 that just came out? So, environment abstraction, um, Java-based application configuration, extending, building on what we already had before. Um, also, 
support for testing with at configuration classes. So um, you previously we were allowed to use configuration classes to configure your application, but you couldn't actually write an integration test that loaded your configuration from those configuration classes. And in 3.1, we added testing support for that that's analogous to the support we previously had for loading an XML configuration file in an integration test. We added um, high-level API for caching. We'll take a look at that in detail later on. Also, we added some support for customizing what we call at MVC or annotation-driven Spring MVC. There's actually quite a bit done there and I'll only touch on that briefly later on. Another point in the MVC area is flash maps and redirect attributes. Um, I won't have time today to talk about that, but if you're interested in that, you can check out some more information in the reference manual. And explicit support for servlet 3.0 in Core Spring. So, environment profiles. What are these? Um, first and foremost, there's an environment abstraction. And what that is is something we like to call an injectable environment abstraction API. So you can have this notion of environment for your Spring application and have it injected into your configuration or your components and access this environment. And there are two core concepts within this. First, there's property sources and green profiles. So property sources um, basically defines where a property comes from. And you can have a variety of sources in your application. Typically, you would have a properties file. But you, you could also have something like system properties, um, environment, servlet context, JNGI, et cetera. And moving beyond that, we have the notion of um, a bean profile. So a profile, in this sense, is a logical grouping of the beans within your configuration. Um, and they only get registered if that profile is active. So you can have multiple profiles at the same time, have them all deployed. And when you start your application, you specify which profile you want to be active for that deployment. Talking about property sources in a bit more detail here. <coughs> we have this property source abstraction. Three things there. First, you have a property source. Where does the property come from? Property resolution. How do they get looked up? And then we talk, we're going to talk about placeholders, so placeholder replacement. So a property source, there's this concept of a property source in Spring that represents a single property source. So, uh, for example, one file. And then going beyond that, you have property sources with an S on the end. And that represents a hierarchy of multiple property source objects um, that could potentially vary then across your deployments depending on uh, the environment you have set up. In terms of property resolution, there's an SPI for that. There's a property resolver. And one thing to note is that the environment itself actually extends property resolver. So once you have access to the environment, you'll also have access to these environment specific properties and property resolution. In terms of placeholders, there's also support for custom placeholder resolution um, analogous to what we had before in Spring. Um, how many people have used property placeholder configure? Or in the namespace, so context, um, property placeholder. Um, that was backed in the past by property placeholder configure. And now in Spring um, 3.1 with these property, supports, uh, property source support, you should use property sources placeholder configure, which basically does the same thing, has the same functionality, replaces the um, occurrences of dollar sign, curly brackets, my key um, within your configuration, but it's pulling them from this property source abstraction that's specific to your environment, so not just from a properties file. Could be from JNDI, for example, or other environment specific property sources. So we've talked about the theory, these property sources. How can we actually manage them? Um, to start with, uh, we can do it in standalone code as we see here at the top. We have an application context we're creating here, so a generic application context. And we'll see here on the context, there's this new get environment method we can call that gives us access to the current environment. And then within the environment, we can get the property sources. Once we have the property sources, we can add um, or remove, et cetera. You can check out the API there. But in this example, we have um, a property source backed by a Java properties file, and we're setting that in the environment. And then afterwards, we call context refresh. <clears throat> so you would do that if you had a very small Java application running with a, a Java main where you wanted to manually bootstrap your um, application context, or for example, if you wanted to do it um, in an integration test on your own, some kind of special test. However, I'll show you later on how to do that with the Spring Test Context Framework using annotations. Now in a web app, um, you're gonna do this uh, programmatically as well if you want. If you implement the application or an application context initializer and then configure that in WebXML via the context parameter called context initialize classes, initializer classes. That will then allow you to configure 
property sources in the application context loaded in your web application. Now moving on, managed and managing properties, how can we actually access these properties? As I mentioned before, this uh, environment is injectable. So we see in this example, we have an at configuration class. So this is a Java config class, which has um, at bean methods defining uh, spring beans as methods here. And then we have at inject, we could have also had at auto wired here for the environment. And then within our bean methods, we can access environment. We see here that we're saying environment get property as class, get property, et cetera. Um, and there's a couple of convenience methods in there that allow you to get them as strings, um, as class, et cetera. Take a look at the API, see how you can use that. Um, we notice as well at the top that we have at property source. So this is a way of specifying for this configuration class, I want to basically register a property source. Um, and in this case, it's a class path resource pointing to a Java properties file. So what you would see here is that when you're saying get property DB URL, it's more than likely coming from this db.properties file. So moving on to next topic, bean definition profiles. As I mentioned before, a profile is basically, basically a logical grouping of bean definitions for a particular environment. For example, you might have a set for development, for staging, for production, for um, acceptance testing, et cetera. Uh, you could also have different sets for different deployment platforms. For, for example, maybe you're deploying to a standard servlet container or maybe you're deploying to, um, to a cloud-based solution. So you'd have different profiles depending on the environment into which you're employing. Now in terms of configuration, there are two options. Obviously there's a way to configure this in XML and a way to configure this in Java configuration. So in XML, um, Beans has been modified to have a profile attribute and for a Java-based configuration, there's a new at profile annotation. So let's take a look at a couple examples here. First, starting with XML. So at the top, we see an example to define the profile for all of the beans in this XML file. So if at the top level beans element, we specify a profile dev, that means that any beans that show up in here will only be active if the dev profile is active. Now, there's another option you can do here. You can have subsets of bean definitions. This is brand new, changes to the XSD. So in the past, beans with an S, plural, was only allowed as a top level element. But now beans is allowed also as nested elements within beans. And then within each of these, you can define profiles. So the nice thing about that is you can have um, beans with the same IDs, for example, a data source. You can have them side by side uh, grouped within their profiles. So you could have the dev data source set up and you could have the production data, um, data source set up and you would see the beans kind of a one-to-one -one correlation within the same file. Now any beans that are defined as top level beans not within one of these profile um, beans would be what I'd call a global bean, meaning it's not assigned to any particular profile, which means that it's always active. So a way to do that is to have all of your standard definitions at the top and then your um, environment specific beans defined within particular profiles. For example, a data source or a connection factory, transaction manager, et cetera. Now how can we do the same thing in Java config? Um, in Java config, we do that for an entire config class. So here again, we see we have an at configuration class. Um, and at the top, we just say at profile, and here we're saying dev. So we're saying this configuration class will only be used if the dev profile is active. Um, one tiny note again. Um, at profile is not limited to use on a configuration class. It can also be used on components. So if you have something um, annotated with that component, such as at service, at repository, at controller, et cetera, um, you could configure that for a particular profile as well. Now, how can we actually activate these profiles? Um, first, we can do it programmatically. Uh, second, we can do it with the system property. We can do it in web XML or we can do it in tests with a new at active profiles annotation. So let's look at a couple of these examples as well. Starting off programmatically, like we had before, we we're creating a, um, here in this case, generic XML application context. From the context, we can retrieve the environment, get environment, and on the environment, we can set the active profiles. So that's a, a var args list there of names of profiles that you want to be active. And then afterwards, refresh, and the context will be loaded with those profiles active, loading the beans that were configured for those profiles. Via system properties, you have two options here. 
So if we're starting our JVM with dash D, spring profiles active, um, then we specify the profiles we want to be active, or we can also specify a default. Um, I didn't talk much about the default. If you want some more details, you can check out the reference manual, but it's basically a way of saying, uh, I wanna have a default profile in case no other profiles are explicitly named. Now in a web application, uh, in this example, we're setting up a dispatcher servlet. So we have our servlet here, servlet class, and then we specify an init param, and dispatcher servlet now recognizes the spring profile's active parameter name for an init parameter, and then you specify the um, profiles that you want to be active for that application context that's loaded for this dispatcher servlet. What's not shown on the slide is you can also do the same thing at the root web application context level by specifying a context param um, at the top level element in your web XML instead of an init param for the particular um, servlet. Now in terms of integration testing, sorry, a bit too far there. Um, how many people actually use the Spring Test Context Framework? A few, okay. So with um, Spring since 2.5, we have the support for um, running integration tests with JUnit's runner support. So we have a custom Spring JUnit 4 class runner listed here saying run with that runner. And then we have our at context configuration, which is saying basically look up um, the context configuration for this class. In this case, it would probably be where it would be an XML file in the same um, directory as the class. But the important thing to note here is that um, when this application context loaded, we wanna specify a particular profile for our integration test. So we're not in production. Um, let me take a step back. So assuming we're using profiles now um, throughout our configuration, if we have production configuration and developer configuration or test configuration, we don't wanna run the production configuration on our local relevant machine because we don't wanna access the live database. Probably not. So in our tests, uh, we wanna run the same code, but we wanna connect to a different database. So what we would do there is we'd specify a profile in our configuration, we're setting up a different data source for our, our development environment. So here we're saying add active profiles dev and then run this test, uh, loading the configuration um, that's mainly the same as our production, except using the dev profile. Now next topic up is Java-based configuration. So some of the enhancements in Spring 3.1. So with Java config, you can think about it as being somewhat analogous or approximating the configuration options we previously had in XML. So for example, in XML, uh, we have XML namespaces, TX, context, et cetera. And now we have a new concept um, called at enable annotations. We'll talk about that in a bit more detail in some examples. Um, in XML, in the past, you would have um, created your own factor bean or used the factor bean from Spring to build more complex objects. And now you have um, the option to use builders within your Java configuration, so using plain Java code and using a builder API. And in terms of um, testing, so in the past we had the generic XML context loader that loaded XML configuration classes for your tests, and now in the background we have an annotation config context loader that loads um, annotation-based annotation configuration or Java config for your cla um, test classes. So as I mentioned, it's, it's kind of a, um, an approximation, but it's not a one-to-one -one mapping from Java config to XML. So what you need to do is just make the, make the best of what Java has to offer. You have a bit more power um, and think about it more as an intuitive uh, annotation oriented way to configure your container. Now, some of the things that were a bit more um, difficult in the past before some of these new at enable annotations were configuring the infrastructure of your application. So for example, transactions, scheduling, um, customizing MVC or um, AOP things like that in Aspect J. So for that, to answer that problem, we've introduced these at enable annotations. These are applied at the class level on um, an at configuration class, and basically equivalent to the XML namespaces that have uh, the same name, for example, the transaction management for the TX namespace, et cetera. So as of Spring 3.1, uh, we have this rather large list here of at enable um, annotations. So at enable transaction management for TX configuration annotation driven, um, caching for the new caching support with annotation-driven caching support. Um, enable async, asynchronous um, method execution on services, for example. Um, scheduling as well, so crons and delayed triggers, et cetera. Um, Aspect J auto proxy, same as you'd see in XML. Um, also load time weaving added towards the end of the 3.1 cycle with support for spring configured if you have at con um, configured classes 
and enable WebMVC, which we'll look at in a bit more detail for custom, customizing how WebMVC is configured, um, but via Java config instead of XML. So next up, Hibernate and JPA. Um, there's also some, some added support here um, in the 3.1 timeline. So uh, for Hibernate 4, there's now a replacement for the existing local session factor bean and annotation session factor bean that you used, for example, um, previously with Hibernate 3 releases. Now there's a, a single local session factor builder um, API as well that allows you to do this programmatically. And I think we'll have an example of that in a minute. Um, in terms of JPA, you can actually now configure JPA in Spring without any XML, which uh, could be nice if you don't like working with XML component descriptors, et cetera. So there's now, um, or rather there's a new property now in the local container entity manager factory bean. This is called packages to scan, and it's analogous to the support we previously had um, for Hibernate and the annotation session factory bean. So you can basically just, as with component scanning, you can scan for your entities and avoid XML configuration. So here we do have an example, um, Java configuration. At the top we see we have at configuration class and at enable transaction management, um, specifying proxy target class equals true. And then within this configuration class we have a few beans. So to start with we have the TX manager, so our transaction manager, and we're instantiating a Hibernate transaction manager that references the, the session factory. The session factory is another bean within this configuration. This is our Hibernate session factory and we're creating here. Um, annotation session factory builder. The name's wrong, uh, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but the point here is that it's the builder instead of the factory beans. We're using a builder API in pure Java and we're just using ch uh, method chaining here. So setting the data source, then setting annotated classes, then setting schema update to true, and at the end we're calling build session factory. So it's kind of a more concise, cleaner way um, than doing it in, in XML with several properties or nested properties, et cetera. Then we have a data source, um, could be from uh, JNDI or local configuration in memory, et cetera. Um, you might actually do that more likely with the profile. Um, but the main point here is that we're using at enable transaction management at the top and that we're using this new builder API. So this is roughly equivalent to what we had previously in XML with the TX namespace with TX annotation driven, specifying the transaction manager and setting the proxy mode um, to proxy the target classes. And we see that there's usually, typically a one-to-one -one correlation between XML attributes in the namespace and annotation attributes. So if you've been using XML, it should be pretty easy to migrate to using the annotation. And as I mentioned before, um, the name in the screenshot is a bit outdated, so the actual current name or real name is local, local session factory builder. So that's it for the major uh, code enhancements in, in CoreSpring, except for the testing support. So I'll talk about that last section here. Um, the new testing features added in Spring 3.1. First and foremost, um, we added support for testing at configuration classes. So as I mentioned before, in 3.0 you could use configuration classes to configure your application, but you couldn't write an integration test um, easily on your own or not supported by the framework. So we added support for that. Um, we also added support for setting the environment profile um, we added a, a new extension to the previous context loader API. So if you haven't really used the test context framework or if you're not um, customizing for yourself, these next two points might not be as important for you, but if you're interested in customizing and extending it, it's good to know that there's a new smart context loader API um, and a new implementation in the background as well. This annotation config context loader that's actually responsible for uh, loading your application context using configuration classes. So, but for most of you, um, we have a delegating smart context loader that's the default now, so if you don't um, specify anything, it will determine whether you're using configuration classes for Java config or if you're using XML, and it will pick the right loader for you and load your application context correctly for your integration tests. We've also updated the way that the, um, the context is cached across um, test execution, so if you're running multiple tests in a suite, um, we, we now have a more complex key that's based on not only, um, in the past, we only based it on the, the resource locations because it was just XML files. Now we base that on um, XML file locations, configuration classes, active profiles, and a few other things. So, as I mentioned before, this new SPI um, supersedes the old context loader SPI, and it's basically the strategy for loading 
um, application context and tests, either from classes or resource locations, which are typically XML files from the class path, uh, and supports these new environment profiles. So um, what does this look like or what's actually been changed? Um, I showed you before, at context configuration is how we configure in our integration tests which application context to load, and that accepts a new classes attribute, as we see here in this example. So here we have classes, and then we can specify an array of configuration classes. Um, those could also be um, annotated components as well. And then your application context will be loaded from those classes for your test. Now for a, a full example here, uh, we, again we had run with in the Spring JNet4 class runner. And we're saying at context configuration, specifying an external configuration class in this example, and then auto wiring in the order service from that, from the application context that was loaded from this configuration. So this is how you configure it if you want to have your configuration external, but you could for um, particular tests have your configuration local to your test. And to do that, you can do something like this. Again, with uh, run with the Spring JN4 class runner at context configuration, but now we're not specifying um, an external class or any particular classes for the configuration. And instead, we're relying on the default, so the convention, the convention over configuration. And the convention is to have a static nested class within your test class that's annotated with that configuration. Um, the name here isn't actually important, um, but basically what the uh, test context remember does is it notices if you have one of these configuration classes static inside your test and uses that to load your application context. And then again, this order service is created here, application context, and we have it injected, auto-wired here, order service from the application context that's loaded for us. So one idea about this, um, if you're into this kind of testing models, what you could do with this configuration, you could actually import XML, for example, and then you could override um, a bean definition programmatically, for example, or modify um, or add some additional beans to be used in your test. So it's kind of a, a nice way to have local configuration, uh, test configuration with the actual test methods in the same class. So caching, the new caching abstraction in 3.1 um, provides declarative caching for Spring applications um, with minimal impact on the code, so just adding some few annotations and then um, allows you to plug in various caching solutions with a few provided out of the box. What does this uh, look like? Wait, did, I get, yep. did I go too far? Yep, okay. So um, there are a few key annotations we can use here. There's at cacheable um, cachevic, there's a few others. Um, but at cacheable basically says that uh, this method is cacheable. So this method returns something and whatever it returns can be added to the cache. So we have a find book method um, based on the ISBN number and it finds something, maybe from the database, maybe from a web service, but in the end it returns it, right? So it returns a book, that means this book can then get cached. And it would be cached under um, the parameters that were passed to the method that would then be used as the key by default. So um, here we're specifying value books, so that's the name of the cache we want the result to be put into. And we can also specify things like conditional, so conditional cache, only if this is true um, do we want the return value to be cached. And in this case, we're seeing a use of spell or the spring expression language to reference um, properties of a parameter passed to this method. So in this case, ISBN is the, the parameter and we can access the group property. That's also like calling get group on it and we're testing that it's equal to one um, and then it would then be stored in the cache. Now on the other side, if we delete an account or if we delete a book or want to invalidate something and have it removed from the cache, we can have separate methods annotated with cache convict, also specifying the same name, same cache name, and then removing um, the object that's passed in, right? So this is ISBN. Here we're storing it in the cache and here we're removing it from the cache. So by default, this cache key uh, uses all of the method arguments, um, but you can also use spell to select more specifically um, elements from the objects passed in. For example, we here have um, key is the ISBN, or you could say key is the root method name, so the name of the method. Um, you can use other spell expressions in there as well. And also mentioned that there's support for conditional caching, so you can use spell to conditionally check if you want something to be cached. In terms of providers, there is a cache 
and a cache manager SPI um, in the org screen framework cache package. And there's a few implementations out of the box. Uh, first and probably the most commonly, there's an EH cache implementation. So um, since it's the cache SPI and EH cache is called EH cache, the implementation is EH cache cache. I know it's two times cache, but that's the name. Um, there's also one for concurrent map cache, so in memory and a concurrent map cache factory bean that allows you to configure the concurrent map cache um, in your application context. So in terms of providers, um, there's each cache, cache manager provider. There's one for the current map. Um, there's also a simple cache and then a no op cache, uh, basically when you wanna have the cache configured but not actually caching anything, for example, in a testing scenario. And then any other implementations can be plugged in because it's a pluggable SPI, so for example, um, there's gem, gem fire support externally, coherence, et cetera. Um, and we'll see later on for uh, 3.2, support for Jcache can also be uh, plugged in as well, hopefully in the future. So how do we configure this? There's a new cache namespace, and we can just say cache annotation driven, and basically what that does is like other support for TX annotation driven for transactional support. Spring looks at the beans if they have at cacheable and at cache evict, then it will create proxies for them and add in the correct infrastructure code in the background to cache and remove elements from the cache. Um, but what it relies on by default is a cache manager bean with that name. So if we specify here cache annotation driven and then a cache manager bean, um, in this example we just have a very simple cache manager using the in memory concurrent map um, back cache. And then we can specify uh, the name of the cache there. So that would map back to what we had used previously in our annotation to specify the name of the cache that we wanted the books to be stored in. Next topic, MVC and REST. Um, several improvements there. Let's try to fly through those. I think we got another 25 minutes or so. So um, in the past with annotation driven Spring MVC configuration in 3.0, um, how did you actually configure MVC? Uh, first, you relied on built-in defaults, which are based on um, a properties file, dispatcher servlet. Um, and in addition, you could use the Spring MVC namespace in XML, so MVC annotation-driven, interceptors, et cetera. So you might have had something similar to this, specifying a um, particular conversion service or a particular um, validator with bean validation, and then specifying custom message converters. And this is pretty decent um, with the, the namespace support. It would be a lot more troublesome without the namespace support. But in 3.0, um, or in 3.1, we're adding more Java config, so we thought it would be nice to have a Java-based configuration option for Spring MVC. Um, basically, the, the reasoning or rationale behind this is that um, most of your Spring MVC configuration is already in Java, so you're already using annotations like at controller, at request mapping, at task variable, et cetera. Um, the question there is, if you're using um, Java for all that, why do you want to switch to XML to configure the, in the internals of MVC or to customize it? Um, and in addition, Servlet 3.0 enhancements uh, further reduce the need for, for web XML at all. You can deploy a web application these days without any XML using annotations, for example. Um, so yeah, the XML namespace, it's, it's nice, um, but it's not completely transparent. There's a lot happening behind the scenes and uh, sometimes it's difficult to get the right level of customization. So if the XML namespace for MVC doesn't support what you want to do, then you'd have to fall back to um, your own Java configuration anyway, or, or your own complex uh, XML configuration. So what should um, Java-based configuration look like for MVC? We mentioned before there's an at enable web MVC annotation. And if you just annotate your config uh, class with that, your Java config class, it will um, enable by default the default MVC configuration, and that's then analogous to um, basically saying MVC uh, annotation driven in XML, and that would look like this. So configuration class at enable web MVC, and um, but the nice thing about it is it allows for configuration similar to what you could do before, but now using Java, and we'll take a few, a look at a few examples here. So a more complete example uh, using component scanning here. Um, for our at controller, so we have an at configuration class, and we're using at component scan, uh, similar to how we would in uh, XML, setting up the base packages and some filters, and declaring at enable web MVC. And then within this config class, we can configure our beans like we would have done previously in XML. Uh, for example, a, a customer view, uh, view resolver, a message source, 
uh, multi-part resolver for files, et cetera. Now, the next question is, um, where is this enabled configuration? Where is this coming from? So if we look at this configuration class, we just see at enabled WebMVC, but it seems like there's a bit of magic going on in the background. So of course there is a bit of magic, um, but it's actually provided uh, by the framework in uh, another configuration class. Um, that's the delegating web MVC configuration um, that basically hooks in this annotation and um, sets up MVC for you. So as you see here, it um, has support for a lot of the things you would have seen, seen in the MVC namespace. Um, now moving on, how can I actually customize all this so it all sounds nice and good, but I want to actually configure this in my app and extend the default configuration. The easiest way to do that is just to implement the web MVC configure interface, or um, better yet, you can extend the web MVC configure adapter, which already implements this interface for you, and then it, you just override the methods that you want to, uh, for which you want to add custom configuration. So this allows you to selectively override uh, custom, or standard configuration. So here we have, um, for example, add formatters, which is passed in the formatter registry. Um, uh, do, we're doing nothing in this case. Um, in this case, we have configure interceptors passed in the configurers, um, and then we can add our own custom interceptors with standard Java code. And this is also probably um, nicer for refactoring, a bit easier to, to grasp if you're starting to shift from XML to Java configuration, or if you want to have all of your web MVC configuration in Java, just like you do for your controllers. Now, the next few things are a bit more low level, um, a bit more advanced. If you are just using MVC and not adding any um, customizations at, at a lower level, like the handler method, so the methods that are getting executed in your controller, this might not be that useful to you, but I'd like to point it out. So um, there's now new support for a handler method abstraction. Um, a handler method is basically uh, the way, or a proper abstraction for the way um, the methods are selected in Spring MVC in a controller. So when you have at controller and you have at request mapping, how does how will the spring know which method to select, which method to execute for that request? Um, but it's not just used for at request mapping methods. It's also used for um, at init binder, for model attributes methods and exception handlers. And there's a few um, support classes out of the box. So for um, request mapping, uh, the handler mapping, for the request mapping for the handler adapter, and also for the exception handling. So if you want to know more about these, you can look at these these classes and see how they're implemented. Um, yeah, that's all I'm going to talk about on, in terms of this new handler method abstraction. As I mentioned, it's a, it's a bit more uh, low level, but I want to let you know that it's there in case you have some custom needs. If you want to um, define new ways to map your methods or to handle the parameters passed to the methods, how they're um, parsed, et cetera. Now moving on to more um, front-facing features for developers that are actually writing controllers. So in, uh, with path variables, um, in the past, we already had support for having path variables and, and RESTful URIs, um, for example, passing in the year and the month, and then specifying at path variable to have those parsed from um, the URI and passed into the method. But if we wanted these to end up in the model, what we had to do was something like we see here in green. So accessing the model and explicitly adding these attributes to the model. So now with Spring 3.1, um, we can delete these because these um, path variables will automatically be added to the model. Similarly, um, we can also use uh, URI templates in our redirect string. So for returning a string from um, a controller method that redirects to another page, for example, if we have redirect colon slash event slash year slash month, um, we don't have to build up this, uh, this URL here um, programmatically with string concatenation with the year and the month. Instead, what we can do, um, these automatically get expanded from the model. So on, on the previous page, we saw year and month. These are automatically added to the model. So on the other side, when we're building up or returning a redirect string, this will automatically get populated from the model. So the year and month are added to the model and then automatically pulled out of the model to autom um, create our or generate our redirect string for us behind the scenes. Moving beyond that, but still on the topic of um, 
URI template variables. Um, they're also used in data binding now, so automatically. In this example, we have slash event slash slug, and slug is our path variable. So, and then we see in, in the method, it accepts um, in a domain entity. For, in this example, we have event, and if we were to look at the event class, it has an ID and a string slug, so a slug property. So what happens here is that this slug, um, this string that's in the URL, URL will automatically get mapped onto the slug property of the event object. So instead of having to pull it out and then call the setter method yourself, it'll automatically get pulled from the, uh, the RESTful URI and mapped onto the correct property in the domain model. Now in terms of uh, media types, um, when we talk about accepting certain media types or generating certain media types with our web applications like, like JSON, whether or not we're accepting JSON or um, accepting HTML, PDFs, et cetera. Um, in the past, so in Spring MVC prior to 3.1, um, you could achieve this, but you had to do this with the headers condition. So um, in request mapping, there was support for headers, and then you could specify uh, explicitly the content type to, for example, application JSON. And on the other side, you could specify the accept type to application JSON, and that would restrict um, whether or not this method got invoked uh, within the controller. But now, um, in Spring 3.1, there's new support for consumes and produces conditions that are more explicit. So instead of specifying content type and accept, you specify consumes and then the media type. And on the same, on the other side, with produces application JSON. So if these things um, don't work out, if it's not matched, then this resorts in an unsupported media type. So the proper HTTP um, status code, so this one 4.15, um, and in the other case, that would re uh, result in a not acceptable uh, response, so 406. That's it for MVC, um, the Spring Source blog, um, and also in the, the reference manual. Now, there's also native service support in, uh, at MVC in Spring 3.0, so for asynchronous request processing, and also for um, the new standard servlet 3.0 specification for file uploads. So this is... Um, Within Spring, this is backed by the multi-part resolver abstraction that Spring's had for many years. So some of you might have been using Commons file upload in the past, and now you can um, do it with the native Servlet 3.0 file upload support. Last but not least, as, oops, a little too fast there. As an added bonus, um, one, five minutes. All right, I'll fly. Um, so with the, there's a, also a new C namespace. Um, who's familiar with the, the P namespace, P colon, for setting properties? So in 3.1, there's now a new shortcut for um, setting up constructor arguments. Uh, you inline the arguments and show you really quickly. So a few examples here at the bottom. So you have C colon age, C colon name. Um, that's specifying the, actually the names of the, the constructor arguments. Um, you could also use an underscore if you wanted to, but that would be be frowned upon, um, but you, so not just literal values, you can also use references analogous one-to-one -to, -one to the, the P namespace. So, since we're not much time, remember everything I've talked about so far, and we'll move on to 3.2 roadmap. Um, so, first and foremost, build system and source control. We have already moved from Subversion to, to GitHub, which might make some people happy, so the, the way going forward to uh, submit patches and everything is um, use Git, have your own fork, and then and ask for um, pull requests, et cetera. Um, that's already in Spring 3.1.1. And check it out, GitHub, um, sorry, github.com, Spring Source, Spring Framework. Um, we're also going to be moving from, away from Spring Build, which was um, custom in-house build solution based on Ant and Ivy to Gradle. And now for all of these uh, 3.2 roadmap issues, um, I list the, the Jira issue here at the bottom if you wanna go check out some more information or watch that issue for yourself. So. Um, spring issue 8120 here. Um, in terms of Servlet 3.0 and 3.1, um, trying to add in more um, built-in support for asynchronous request processing within the framework, so within Spring MVC, for example, to have um, methods that are, that are executed asynchronously at the controller level. In terms of Java EE um, updates, so updating to um, JPA 2.1, building on the uh, 2.0 to support already in Spring 3.0. Um, also upgrading to JSF 2.2, just trying to stay up to date with specification compatibility there, basically. And JMS 
which is um, a long overdue major overhaul to, to JMS. So I don't know if anyone's been following with JMS 2.0, um, but they're really trying to improve. It's been, it's been many, many years since there's been an upgrade to JMS. And um, basically one of the big benefits is that it'll have a more um, modern API using annotations, um, some of the languages features in Java 5, for example. And it might um, work out nicely to have, um, while well, we're exploring um, ways to have a native JMS API style when using Spring, basically analogous to what we have currently with JMS template um, that makes it easy to use older versions of JMS um, and then seeing where JMS 2.0 goes in terms of the new um, programming or application programming model there. Um, caching, uh, I briefly mentioned before, um, Jcache. So um, we're looking to add support for Jcache. That's a JSR 107, so the standard um, caching API for Java and then adding in the corresponding um, cache manager and cache adapters in Spring's SPI, um, as well as cache, Jcache Manager and Jcache Factory Bean. Um, ideally, we would like this to work um, pretty much straight out of the box using cache annotation driven if you have Jcache present. Um, but we'll be investigating what we can do there. In terms of uh, validation, so we already had Bean validation support in 3.0, and now we're building on what we have there to uh, stay up to stay up with the specification in 1.1 and see where we can um, add some, some nice new features in Core Spring to build on that as well. In Core Spring, uh, we'll be migrating away from um, the now outdated legacy CGLib to Java Assist, um, as other frameworks have already done, for example, um, Hibernate. Um, so for bas basically class-based um, proxies and AOP, et cetera, um, we would then um, be switching to using Java Assist instead of CGLib, which hopefully wouldn't affect uh, any of the developers directly unless you're doing something, something custom. Um, in terms of bean definitions, I'll also be looking at visibility and overriding, for example, um, providing a way to have final beans, um, perhaps to have profile scope beans, so beans that are only visible within a particular scope, in other words, not visible to other beans defined outside of um, that profile. Um, also, um, we're looking to find a way to, or provide a way to override bean definitions in XML with um, bean definition methods using at bean and configuration files. So in the testing support, what we plan to do there is um, add new support for unit tests, unit testing your um, screen configuration for your controllers, um, basically simulating the dispatcher servlet using mock MVC classes. Uh, Ross and Stoyanchev and I gave a talk on, on some of these topics um, at Spring 12GX back in October. So if you want some more information on that, I recommend you check out um, his uh, GitHub account or you can ask me later on, I can give you a URL. Um, we're also going to be adding in support for writing integration tests that run against a web application context. So in the past, um, we were only able to run against standard application context, so a generic XML application context, or now an annotation config um, application context, but not against a web application context. And that would be very useful for testing things like um, uh, request scope beans, session scope beans, et cetera. So if you want to test integration test components that depend on the infrastructure of, of the dispatcher server being there or of, um, for web requests within a server container, but with a server context mocked out. So we'll be looking at ways to do that. And in closing, um, just some links to further resources. So Spring Framework, hopefully everyone knows springframework.org. Um, you can find lots of information there. The reference manual, I highly recommend you, that you read if you have any particular questions about a specific area. Um, Javadoc as well. Source code, it's open source. Um, Spring forums, if you have any questions, you can discuss within the community on the forums. And if you find any, any bugs or have any um, desires for new features in Spring, please uh, report them on uh, the JIRA instance there. So um, in terms of blogs, uh, nothing out on 3.2 yet, but if you want to check out some of the more, or more detailed information on 3.1, you can look at the 3.1 category on the Spring Source Team blog um, and also on my company blog with mine. And question and answers, how much time? One minute. <laughs> no questions? Yep. In Spring Room. Um, I don't, do you know that? Did you, oh, so the question was, um, are there any plans in Spring Roo to allow the application context to be built with Java config instead of XML? No, no, the answer is no, we don't know. Sorry. <laughs>
Okay, well, if you have any other questions, you can uh, find me and some of the other spring guys uh, afterwards. We'll be here for the entire conference. So thanks for coming.